Hello, this is Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff and I have a little friend here beside me. This is Jose, and Jose is a Galaxy Note 2. And Jose is actually pretty flipping awesome. Today I want to show you an in-depth, non-biased review of the Galaxy Note 2 so that you can decide for yourself. Is this the phone that you want to keep in your purse, in your pocket? What's the media experience like? What's the battery life like? What's the improvements of the original Galaxy Note versus the Galaxy Note 2? I want to show you all the awesome features of the S Pen and show you just how much it has contributed towards making the smartphone what it is. So I want to show you all of that and everything that I possibly can think of, but before we get into the review, I want to let you know that this review is going to be just a little bit on the long side, but not to worry, because it is entirely time-coded. That means if you go down to the description, you'll see that everything is arranged topic by topic so that you can jump around to see anything that you want to see at any point during the video. That way you can watch the entire thing with me, or you can personalize your experience. So let's go and check it out, Jose, and show everyone how awesome and cool you are. That's a little bit weird. First and foremost, let's talk about the form factor. Yes, this is a big, big phone. I'm going to be comparing it to a couple other phones, including the original Galaxy Note and the Galaxy S3, so that you can see the differences in sizes. Also, I will be doing a pocket test so you can see if this is this a little bit too big for you, or is it manageable? Now, I've got teeny tiny little hands, and I haven't had any complaints. Since they have made this phone longer and changed the actual width of the phone, it is now more manageable and comfortable in the hand, actually, than the original Galaxy Note. So let's go and check that out. When comparing the overall builds of the Galaxy Note 2 and the original Galaxy Note, I very much prefer the Galaxy Note 2. Even though the Galaxy Note 2 seems to be a little bit bigger of a phone, just the change in the aspect ratio of it makes it that much easier and more pleasant to hold in the hand. Their camera and flash placement is the same, and so is the speaker on the bottom. Also, you've got the same placement for the S Pen. Then you've got a change of position of your microphone on top, and also of your headphone jacks. They changed the button placement on the Galaxy Note 2. I find it to be more friendly for small hands. I can easily reach those, whereas before it was just a little bit too high up, and I'd have to choke up my hand to get to those volume buttons. The same goes for the power button. It's also a lot easier to press. So yay, big phone, more ergonomically designed for the small person like myself. Here we have our four device pileup so you can get a nice reference of sizes here. This is the Nexus 7, then we've got the Galaxy Note 2. On top of that is the Galaxy S3 and then the little tiny iPhone 5. Now my hand is about six inches long for a further reference point here. You can see it's just about the size of my hand. Now in comparison to the Nexus 7, which is a small tablet, you can see that the Galaxy Note 2, really in perspective, is not all that big. Now as for how thin, the Nexus 7 is quite a thin tablet and the Galaxy Note 2 is still thinner than that. Go ahead and grab the Galaxy S3 here for you. Then you've got the iPhone 5, which fits inside the display of the Galaxy Note 2. And as far as thinness, the iPhone 5 it does take the cake on that, but it's not too horrible. I find it to be quite manageable. The build quality to me feels quite nice. People are concerned because the back cover is made of a flimsy plastic. But honestly, once it's on the phone, there shouldn't be any issues. It feels like it's almost an integrated part of the phone itself. And it doesn't feel cheap to me, that's the thing, is that even though this is made out of plastic, it feels solidly built and not like it's going to break if I were to squeeze it. This display is protected with Gorilla Glass 2, which is supposed to be resistant to shattering, also resistant to scratches. But honestly, the name Gorilla Glass in front of anything doesn't mean anything. Exactly. For example, if there's a mineral that comes in contact with your screen that is of a 7 on the most scale of hardness or higher than that in hardness, it will scratch your display. Now don't tell me that you don't come in contact with any type of minerals that are like that. Quartz. Quartz sand. That is pretty much the most abundant mineral on this planet. And if it comes in contact with your screen, game over. The same thing with silt. So I think it's important to invest in a screen protector with a screen of this size because as soon as you get into larger screens, the greater the surface area, the greater the chance that you're going to get something that comes in contact with it. So right now this is a Spigen SGP Crystal Clear Screen Protector. It's wonderful as it doesn't cause any decrease in sensitivity with the S Pen. Also, I've noticed with some screen protectors and the S Pen that it can leave bubble lines underneath. It looks kind of like white cracks or scratches. 
This one doesn't do that. Also, there's no decrease in clarity, so I fully recommend it. The one other thing to keep in mind is that since this is a curved display, your screen protectors aren't going to be able to go all the way to the edge if they're one of the dry install. If you want to, you can get yourself a Zag screen protector, which will go all the way to the edge, or an XO skins, but this gives the best overall natural feeling of the original display. So how about overall durability of the Galaxy Note 2? I should probably call it droppability. The design is similar to the Galaxy S3, though I am very happy that Samsung decided to make the bezel a lot meatier than what's on the Galaxy S3. I have heard horror stories of people dropping the Galaxy S3 onto the carpet. They pick it up and the display is shattered. That's not promising. In every other drop test I have seen, the Galaxy S3 display is annihilated with a small drop. That is not so with the Galaxy Note 2. It is actually fairly durable. I can speak from experience as the first thing that happened when I brought this home is I handed it to my dad who was fascinated by the size and what does he do? He drops it onto the hard laminate floor. It hits a corner, the cover snaps off, the battery bounces out and I don't even know where it went and it skid across the floor on its face. I almost died. I picked it up, I looked at the bezel and there wasn't a scratch or a ding on it, and the screen was entirely fine as well. By that point, I already had a screen protector, so no scratches or issues. But I'm very happy to see that. I saw a drop test on Android Authority where the phone was held up to about six feet in height, and the same exact behavior had happened where it will hit a corner and it doesn't end up cracking the screen. I think that the battery cover coming off and the battery coming out kind of absorbs some of that impact. It's kind of funny that the battery cover coming off and the battery bouncing out is the savior of this phone. I would think I would call that cheap if it comes apart like that. But hey, something's gotta give, right? Get off the stage! When it comes to direct sunlight, this screen does almost perfect job. Check that out. Look how crystal clear everything is in direct sunlight. This is on full brightness. And the whites are perfectly pristine and crystal clear. You can read the text, no problem whatsoever. Even at medium brightness, it is still perfectly readable in direct sunlight. You can see the refresh rate of the screen there, but you can get a good idea of just how well the screen does. Very, very nice. If you're somebody who reads a lot of books or needs to use your phone outside a lot, and if you're worried about the sun, don't be. All right, pocket test. Here is the Galaxy Note 2 here, and this is the iPhone 5. You can see just how much bigger the Galaxy Note is as compared to the iPhone 5. Let's go ahead and stick this big giant in my pocket. Now, these are tight-fitting jeans, the ones that I like to test out for these types of tests. I am a small girl. I am about five feet tall, so it looks ridiculous in my pocket, granted, but you know what? It doesn't bother me. I would walk around like this shamelessly. The only issue that I would have is upon sitting. I, that, no, that's, that's not gonna work out. So you have to take it out of your pocket and set it on a table, put it in a case if you're worried about that, or put it in your purse. Now, if you're somebody who has big baggy jeans, if you're a tall gentleman, you're over six feet tall, you're not gonna have to worry about this. If it's in pocket nicely, you'll see an embossment in the pant leg of the phone itself, but it's not distracting in any way, shape, or form. Now, here's the iPhone 5 in my tiny little tight-fitting jeans. If I put this in here, you can see that the Galaxy Note 2 came up to about here, now here's the iPhone 5. Not only does it fit in pocket nicely, but I can shove it in that nook there. So that's really the comparison between a very large phone and a smaller phone. So if you're someone who's conscious about how you look and you think you're gonna look retarded or whatever, get a different phone or put it in your purse. Gentlemen who have tight fitting jeans, you're probably in that same category. Otherwise, if you have baggy jeans, you're not gonna have a problem with this guy. Just realize you're gonna feel it on your leg a little bit. So how about the operating system? Yes, it is Jelly Bean, and yes, it has Touch Whiz on it, but let me say something. Samsung, I applaud you. It is very nice. I think what you have done shows a huge step forward in the industry way before what other companies should have done, especially in terms of a lot of the features I have to show you exactly what it is that I mean, but I know a lot of you, as soon as you get a phone, the first thing that you do is root the thing and put something like Cyanogen Mod on it. But if I was to do that and flash a custom ROM, they'd better the hell get it exactly the way that Samsung has done it. Or I'd feel like I was violating the phone and stripping out all the neat features that gives this phone its identity. 
Even with TouchWiz on here, Jelly Bean is incredibly fast. Check this out. There is absolutely no lag between the home screens. That Project Butter works real well. For me, one of the neatest features included in TouchWiz is that you are able to pull the drop down here. And I love this bar across the top that lets me see all my options to turn on different modes without having to dig into all the settings. You see you've got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, you can mute it from there, you can turn on or off screen rotation, airplane mode, power saving mode, driving mode, all sharecast, and your sync. Also in addition is this new slider that you have so that you can turn up and down your screen brightness. I find that to be very handy and also you've got your auto mode there as well. TouchWiz has a huge amount of integrated features with the S Pen. Let me start off by showing you. Once you pull the S Pen out, it makes a bit of a zing vibration to let you know that the pen has been detected or taken out of the phone. That's something that's interesting from the original Galaxy Note because I now have Jelly Bean on here, the official TouchWiz version, and when you take the S Pen out, it's not recognized. So that's something that's exclusive that I have seen to the Galaxy Note 2. The menu that pops up upon taking the S Pen out is called Page Buddy. I really love this. It brings up a panel that allows me to immediately make S Note documents. I also have a list of recommended applications down here in order from what I use the most. So I find that very, very handy. Then when you plug the pen back in, it recognizes it's back in its chassis and it goes away discreetly, never to bother you again until after taking the pen out. And of course, if this annoys you, you can disable this in settings without any trouble. The Page Buddy features are actually quite extensive, so if I was to take this pair of headphones and plug it into the jack, you will see that it recognizes it and it immediately brings up Page Buddy for me for earphones as well. I can see my media, I can get to songs that I have on here, and then of course it brings up most used and recent apps that have to do with media. And then once I take the pen out, it goes right back to my default settings. That's very user friendly and very intuitive. Love it! Before furthering our quest with the S Pen, I want to show you motion. This is something that just makes the phone for me. I love this. Of course, if you want to use motion settings, make sure that under system settings, under your general settings, that motion is on. Go ahead and click on that. And you have a whole huge amount of features that let you interact with your phone in a way that I didn't think of. I wouldn't have thought to innovate this. This is, oh my goodness gracious. So quick glance. It's a little bit creepy. I kind of like it, but again, it's creepy. So it says on here, check key information at a glance by reaching towards your device while the screen is off. So basically it keeps the proximity sensor on. Yeah, do you see how it's flashing there? That little purplish flashing light, that's a proximity sensor. So when you have your phone sitting down on the couch, this freaked me out the first time because it was on by default. I reached towards the phone and all of a sudden it turned on. I'm like, what is that? And you can see if there's an email or text message or something that you missed, you can check on your battery life, tells you the time. Let's do that again. Reaching towards your phone. Magic! 1.17 a.m. Yeah, I should be sleeping. Another feature that I really love is called direct call. So just say that you are underneath a contact of somebody. You don't have to hit the call button. I can pull this up to my ear. And when I do that, I hear a vibration, and even though I don't have a SIM card in here, it will call that person. Where it becomes super useful is when you're underneath text message. So just say that I'm texting this fictitious person. If I was to hold it up to my ear and I don't feel like texting them at the moment, I just want to say it over voice, I can hold it up again to my ear. Calls the person right then and there, so that is super handy. Smart Alert is also incredibly useful, I have found. So just say you missed a phone call or you miss a text message. If your phone is sitting on the couch, you can reach towards it and once you touch it, it'll vibrate to let you know, oh crap, I missed a message. So also if you miss a text message and your phone is in your pocket and you take a step, it'll vibrate as well. And that has let me know, oh, I missed a text message. So it's quite handy. Under display features, you've also got smart rotation and smart stay. Smart rotation is interesting. If just say that you're looking at a web page or you're doing something and you happen to turn your head and you don't want the screen to rotate, the camera will turn on, recognize your face looking at it, and it will stay in this proper orientation instead of turning on you. 
I find this feature to be useful, but sometimes if I'm actually trying to turn it, it'll recognize my face and it doesn't want to rotate. That gets annoying during videos like on YouTube. Smart Stay is pretty cool. It's also gimmicky. You need to hold the phone pretty close to your face so that it can see that you have eyes. It works that out by the certain distance that you're holding it from your face. And then if it sees that you're looking at the screen, it'll make sure not to turn the screen off so you don't have to keep tapping it and having the screen time out. So all those intuitive features just make this phone what it is. On the Galaxy Note 2, you get two different types of voice recognition software. You get both Google Now and S Voice. To get to Google Now, you just need to hold down the menu button and it pulls it up for you. For S Voice, you just need to double tap there on the home button and there it is. Now there is something that Google took away that S Voice doesn't do either. If I want to try calling and doing a localized search, I should be able to tell it, call Pizza Hut or call Walmart. It should be able to see where I am by location, find the nearest Walmart, and then call the number. It's not able to do that now with either S Voice or Google Now. Why? I used to love that feature. It used to exist. S Voice uses Google Now web search features, so you'll be able to ask it the same questions and it will pull up usually the same answers. Hi Galaxy! What is 100 times 100? 10,000. And it's able to answer just like it would with Google Now. What is the fastest car? JCB Diesel Max. Really? Let's see what Google has to say. What is the fastest car? This is a progressive history of the world's fastest street legal production car over the years as opposed to concept cars are. Whoa. Wow. What? What is the lowest point on the earth? Dead sea. What is the lowest point on the earth? What is the lowest point on the earth? 35,840 feet. Yeah, inconsistencies. How hot is the surface of the sun? What's your problem? Doesn't like it. What, whatever. How hot is the surface of the sun? Well, at least it was able to pull up surface temperatures, although it said, what is the surface of the sun? It's not working! How old is Justin Bieber? 18 years, 8 months, 19 days. Yeah, so if S Voice decides it doesn't like your question, it just simply ignores you, or at least Google tries to answer your question. Fail, Samsung, fail! So with S Voice, you were able to dial a contact very reliably. You can compose a text message, you can search contacts, you can ask it to navigate, which Google Now does very well as well. You can create an S memo, which will write out a memo and save it under your S notes. You can create schedules at a future event, which you cannot do with Google Now. You can create tasks doing that same thing. You can play music from here. You can make a social update. You can search the internet. Searching is okay. If you say search, then whatever it is you're searching for, it'll find it all right, I guess. You can ask it to open up an application. You can ask it to make a voice recording. You can ask it to enter into driving mode. You can ask it to set alarms, timers. You can ask it the weather, which Google now does by default. You can ask it to turn on or off simple controls, such as Wi-Fi. Do not use the get an answer function from S Voice. It's a major, major, major fail. And you can also do local listings, such as find restaurants in the area. But honestly, if you have any type of question, use Google Now. And then if you want to do a command, go under Google Voice and it works fantastically. One other handy feature with S Note is that you can now use the S Pen to write out a command. Just say that it's just way too loud in an area. So that's where this would work. I can say call Susie Driscoll. And it will call Susie Driscoll. I found Susie Driscoll in your address book. No problem at all with that, so that's quite nifty. Also, I should mention that even though Jelly Bean does not support Adobe Flash, or at least Adobe Flash decided to stop officially supporting Jelly Bean, you can still download Adobe Flash and install it on your phone without even having to root your phone, which is really very nice, actually. Simple Google search brings me to XDA developers, and I can download one of the APKs right here from the site. 
can show you that it works perfectly by going to one of my favorite flash sites, which is homestarrunner.com. And, and it works perfectly. The other one. Let's show you all the neat features of the S Pen, shall we? Okay, so just in case you don't think that this phone is cool already, let's start showing you the S Pen features. There are commands that you can do with the S Pen. To pull up the menu button, hold down the command key on the S Pen and make an up arrow. So doing that will show you your menu features and you can easily navigate around with that. And if you want to go backward, you just need to make a back arrow. So simply use the command button again, back arrow, and there you go. You can easily exit out and navigate to your heart's content. There's no need to put your S Pen back in the chassis if you don't want to, although it would be handy if there was some feature to be able to press the home button reliably. Another feature that I have found to be pretty cool is the quick command box. Just hold down the command button with your S Pen and make an upward movement like that. Here's your quick command box. Inside here you can write out these symbols or even program your own to be able to do things like search the internet, or make an email or pull up navigation. You can call people right from here. You can make a test message. So just say that I'm looking for something on the internet. Let's demonstrate this. So let's write question mark cookies. See if it can read my handwriting. Yes, and it recognizes cookies. Not the cookies that I like, but cookies. So now you're like, fine, that's great and all, but what about pinch and zoom? If you don't want to use your fingers again, you can just use the S Pen with the left hand side of your screen you can easily pan around and zoom in to your heart's content. The one thing that I find annoying is that for this particular command you don't have to hold down the command button here. Heck, you can actually just use your thumb if you'd like to and go up and down. I haven't found a way to disable that. It can get annoying if you're one of those people who just likes to use the very side of your screen and your thumb to scroll around. No mas, you can't do that anymore because if you do that, you're just gonna get a big zoomed in version of what you didn't want to look at anymore anyway. Having fun with the S Pen. Now we're gonna do hover. Yeah, hover is when you hold the S Pen over something that's in a group, just say, and it makes a little air view of what you're looking at. It's actually called air view. So there's a bunch of them. It says, hey, there are 73 in camera. So if I don't want to actually go in the whole thing, I can see what's in here. Very nice. One other feature that I really like is the scroll feature. I can use the S Pen without even having to touch the screen to make a little arrow appear. And you can see it scrolls up and down the page for me. Whee! Although I don't see much purpose for that, I can just as easily use my pen to scroll up and down. I found using S Note with the S Pen to be quite enjoyable and use it a lot more than I actually thought I would, being artistic and all. You have several options. You can create notes, you can make birthday cards, you can compose meeting notes, you can make magazines by adding your own videos or pictures into it, you can make your own diary entry by adding your own pictures into it, you can make recipes if you'd like to. It creates these templates that you can edit yourself. I find that to be very fun. Endless fun. So I'm gonna make a note here. You can change the backgrounds yourself if you'd like. They give you a variety of different things from plain paper to things that look like little notepads. Let's just pick plain white background. You have a wide variety of drawing tools such as pens or paint brushes or pencils, markers if you'd like. You can adjust the thicknesses of all of these tools. You also have a color palette. You can choose from the preset ones or get to any color that you'd like. You also have a dropper tool, so if you're trying to match color, you can get to that color easily. You have the ability to create shapes, you can draw functions, also you can have handwriting to text, which does very well, I find. I love the recording feature that they've added, so you can record your voice into a note, just in case you need to hear it later, what was going on. The insert is what's really neat. You can take pictures, you can add images, you can record videos straight from here and have it in the note as you're writing stuff about that video. You can get stuff in your clipboard if you had taken a picture from the internet. You can add maps and write on them, as you can see under here. You can add sketches, so if you go under sketch idea and you say cat, it'll pull up cat. You can add it there, you can then change the size 
and set it next to the dog on the freeway. Good, good place. You can add text box, you can add shapes. So this has become a very functional and fun to play with type of notepad. The capture feature is also very fun with the S Pen. What you need to do is to again hold down the command button on your S Pen and trace an image of your liking, such as a cookie. I got it off the internet. And you just need to trace it, go all the way around it, and then go and hit that circle that you started with. Let go. If you're satisfied with it, it'll let you tap it, or you can hit the X. So I'm going to go ahead and tap it. It saved it to my clipboard. Now I can go back to S Note and pull it from the clipboard. As you can see here, this was my capture. And if I want, I can draw all over it, put icing, whatever the heck makes sense for me. Or I can go into the photo editor and it's got there right from the clipboard for me. And I can go ahead and add effects if I want. I can make pop art. I can make it grayscale. I can add old photo or vintage effects. I can add decorations such as adding frames or putting on stickers. Let's give him a heart. Yeah, he doesn't want to be eaten. He's alive. I can draw all over it with the S Pen again in this application here. Don't eat me. So you can do all kinds of fun things. Go ahead and say done. I can also pull up edited pictures from my gallery and go ahead and open that again. Another option that we have under advanced edit, we were just playing with the photo editor. You can do paper artist. That's also included on the phone itself. And you can add all these cool effects to it. I like this one. Don't eat me. This one's actually called cookie. Let's save it. And you can share right from the application. There's a variety of pictures here that I drew on for a demonstration video. You can check that out. I will also link that in my description where I dressed up as a character called Susie Driscoll and trolled myself and started writing on my Facebook friend pictures. So you can see some of my handiwork that you can also do with the S Pen and the Advanced Editor and Paper Editor. So I've been having lots of fun here. Here are some other various features that you have with the S Pen. Go ahead and hold down your command button on your S Pen again and double tap. That'll bring up a S Note window. Hello. I think that says hello. Not to forget screenshot that you can do with the S Pen as well. Hold down your command button again. Hold the screen. And then you'll see that it makes the flash and it brings up this toolbar here. Now if you want to, you can push the check mark and simply save a screenshot in your gallery, which will be titled Screenshots. Or you can decide to crop it right then and there. And it will save it under an edited section in your gallery. Then hit the check mark. Or if you want to, you can decide to write on it right then and there. So cookies. Oh, I see peanut butter and double chocolates with macadamia. Let's execute the pop-up browser by picking a video here from Google. It says C is for cookie. Yes, I am on a cookie trend. I want a cookie. Go ahead and select it. And it gives you options here. You can open it in YouTube, or if you want, you can go ahead and open it in a pop-up browser. Say just once. There's the pop-up browser. And you are free to do anything that you want to as you have this pop-up browser here. Now what starts with the letter C? Yay! C is, C is for cookie while writing emails. There's a couple of other features, such as multi-window that is now on the Sprint version and on the international version. It will be coming to the T-Mobile version, but I don't have that just yet. But check out a little bit from this video here. There's this really cool menu where you can select uh, an application and drag it to the screen and make it full screen or make it uh, part of the screen. So I can go to Maps and be in the browser at the same time and I can choose which side at the same time as I have the pop-up window. So that's actually three things and you can resize the window. Alright Jose, let's go talk about your quad-core goodness and other innards. I really wonder why I decided to genderize you as male. I don't really see much evidence of such. 
Here we have three super phones sporting the Exynos CPU. We have the Galaxy Note 2, the original Galaxy Note, and the Galaxy S3. The Galaxy S3 and the Galaxy Note 2 have the exact same CPU, except for this one's overclocked to 1.6 gigahertz versus 1.4 gigahertz. It becomes really noticeable for me, at least in web pages, because this one finishes loading web pages a lot quicker, and I will show you an example of that. But in terms of the Jelly Bean experience on both the Galaxy S3 and the Note 2, it is very, very quick and responsive. Although still, the Galaxy Note takes it in terms of responsiveness. It's really very both enjoyable and insane. Still, the S3 is no slouch and is also very quick with Jelly Bean. And now in the middle, we have the original Galaxy Note with a 1.4 dual-core Exynos processor. It used to be the best, and now it just doesn't even compete, even in responsiveness. The screen just is not as responsive as it is on either of these two guys. See, I can't get it to register sometimes. Once you're using the stylus, it works just fine. You can see just how fluid it is, but in terms of fingerprints, it's not as responsive as I would like it to be now that I'm able to compare it to these new guys. So even though this has the exact same operating system as my Galaxy Note 2 now, it just doesn't feel as fast. Everything I do does not feel as fast. Let's show you some web speeds in LoadXDAdevelopers.com. This is a very HTML, CSS intensive web page. Ah, the Galaxy Note 2 has finished and the Galaxy S3 is still loading. For any of you complaining about tabs, there's only one tab open in both of them. So we are still waiting on the S3 and they're connected to the exact same router as well. Come on little S3, what are you doing? Shouldn't be this slow. Ah, there we go. So several seconds faster. I want to do that again though. This is our second run just to prove and keep consistencies. is finished on the Note 2 and the S3 looks like it's struggling just a little bit. Hmm. There we go. Yep. Note 2 takes it by a long shot actually. So how about them GPUs? They've both got Mali 400 MP4 GPUs clocked at 400 megahertz. So the performance I've seen has been relatively exactly the same. I can show you some of the gameplay power and N64 OID. I can tell you that the Mali 400 is a very fast GPU, a very good GPU. At one time it was the best GPU on the market until iPhone 5 came along and took the crown, but still every game in the Android market that exists is going to be able to play just fine. Beautifully. Just wonderfully. Except for when you get to triangle fill rate with really advanced 3D graphics filling polygons that you would see on an unrealistic stress test from GL Benchmark in Egypt HD, where the iPhone 5 ends up smoking both of these guys, where these get roughly half the frame rate speed that the iPhone 5 does. But still, let me show you. Even though the Galaxy S3 and the Galaxy Note 2 have the exact same GPU, even at its clock, I would prefer the Galaxy Note 2 because the screen is just so big that everything is tangible. Everything is very beautiful and easy to see, especially with the Super AMOLED display. Super Mario 64 almost plays perfect now in terms of frame rates on the Galaxy Note 2. Once in a while you'll see a little bit of jitter, but it's not very often at all. This feels to me as if playing exactly the same on a game console. Don't die! No! Gameplay in Mario Kart N64 is perfect now. This is just really, really fun. I may not be very skilled at Mario Kart, but I can play it. Even though the Galaxy S3 has a smaller screen, it's got the exact same resolution as the Galaxy Note 2. So it's going to have the exact same demand on processing power from the GPU. That means that the size of the screen doesn't matter. It will still do just as well as the Galaxy Note 2 and the Galaxy Note 2 the same.
In terms of RAM for both of these, the Galaxy Note 2 now has two gigabytes of RAM over the one gigabyte that's on the Exynos version. Now, if you have the United States or Canadian version that has the Qualcomm chip in it, you will have two gigabytes. What I can say is that having two gigabytes is so nice. It's not excessive. It makes multitasking a lot more of a joy. The phone doesn't have to sit there worrying about how much RAM it has free. You can see on the Galaxy Note with one gigabyte, you have 376 megabytes being used with processes and programs in the background. Where on the Galaxy Note 2, you're only using 630 megabytes out of 1.75 gigabytes. If that doesn't explain it for you, I don't really know what will. With the amount of RAM on this thing, I can easily watch a Flash movie on the internet or browse the internet. I can have a pop-up browser watching a YouTube video. I can sit here writing an S note all at the same time. If I have multi-window view, I can use that at the same time. And heck, I can even take the pen here and make myself a screen capture, all without having to slow down the system. Now that is mighty impressive. So let's talk about the display. Let me tell you that it is completely gorgeous and very sharp. A lot of people are freaking out because they say that the original Galaxy Note has more pixels, but they're forgetting something. Even though they have cut down the width here and there are less pixels this way, the original Galaxy Note is pen tile. What does that mean exactly? In a normal display, like an LCD display, it has a stripe pattern. That means that every pixel has three subpixels, red, green, and blue. In a pen tile display, every pixel only has two subpixels instead of three. That means it goes green, red, and then another pixel will be green, blue. So they are effectively cutting out the number of red and blue subpixels that you have. They say that they do this to cut down the number of blue subpixels so that the display doesn't wear out as fast, but I haven't seen any evidence of that. Pen tile displays are not true HD displays. Now the Galaxy Note 2 is not of a pen tile arrangement. It is not like a stripe arrangement where it has red, green, and blue side by side. It is something new. I want to zoom in very, very close to show you exactly what I mean, and you'll see that it has a higher subpixel density, so in fact, has a higher resolution screen. The Galaxy Note 2 display is so much better than the original Galaxy Note's display. As I was saying, people are freaking out that there is less of a pixel density because it's 285 pixels per inch because the width is a lot wider versus the 267 pixels per inch on the Galaxy Note 2. But it's not just about sheer pixels. It's about the technology behind the displays. And this is Pentile and doesn't have as many subpixels as this one does. Let's go ahead and show you. First, we're gonna zoom in really close on the Galaxy Note original. I prefer using the chrome icon so that you can see what's going on with red, green, and blue. Look here. Look at the barn doorish effect that you see. Look at the green pixels. Do you notice how those look like they are a much higher density than you can see in the red pixels? That's because of the pentile matrix. There are more green pixels than red or blue. But a contraire with the Galaxy Note 2. Check these two out side by side. Which one looks obviously more sharp to you? That's because you now have three subpixels per pixel. The only thing that's different is that long, rodish looking blue pixel, and then you have a green and a red. Now you can see what I mean. Here's the Galaxy Note 2. You've got that rod-shaped blue pixel, and you've got your green and your red, which are a lot smaller. Supposedly, that's supposed to help keep the display from wearing out with the blue pixel so fast, but I already have some burn-in, actually, on my display. I mean, it's not completely apparent. If I take the display and I have a stark blue image and I turn the display, I can kind of make out where my text box has burned into the display. And it's only been about a month since I got this phone, so that's a bit sad, but it's not affecting anything so far. We will see what happens after three or four months. I've now turned out the light and we've got my display here. Let's see while rotating and if you can make out any of the keyboard that's being burned in, as well as this area, this white area that was for the chat box. If you're someone who chats or texts a lot, I'd recommend not using this phone during that because a static image is going to burn in an image on your display. Static is an image that's not moving. It's one that stays the same the whole time. So that is what is potentially damaging to these types of displays. Let's talk about the media experience with the display. Oh my gosh. I can tell you that this is fantastic. The contrast ratio is fantastic. The colors are fantastic. And they fixed the black clipping issue. I've seen a little bit of variations, but on a lot of them I've seen, they don't have black clipping anymore. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. The overall media experience is amazing. Gameplay is amazing. Watching movies is amazing. And now without the black clipping problem,
Since Samsung has gotten rid of the black clipping effect, everything looks so unbelievable. The Avengers series, I can finally watch it without any issues. The blacks are rich, the contrast is wonderful, the colors are unbelievable. It's an experience that you just can't match on any other type of display. Major difference that Samsung has made that is allowing you to see such beautiful shadows now in movies is that they have tweaked the MDNIE finally. That was badly screwing things up, such as if you were watching video and you came to a scene that was darker, or if you had anything where there was a lot of shadows. So it's, for example, in a light scened movie, if you were looking at a bush, in direct sunlight you could see a lot of very beautiful vibrant colors, but as soon as that bush started to fade, into shadow, instead of it going from a light green down to a darker green, it would go green, black, so you're losing all that definition and that's because, look, you're missing all those shades here. It just goes right at 8 to black. That's why you would be seeing green, then suddenly black. And that's no good because you want to be able to see all that definition in between. So in any type of darker movies, things that are darker there is no variation in shadow, it's just all blacked out. So it looks very strange in some movies. So I'm very happy that they have changed that on the Galaxy Note 2 because now a darker scene movie experience is wonderful rather than just too contrasty. So let's go take a look. Here is a scene from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 1. I really like the Harry Potter series because it shows you really if you have any issues in a dynamic fashion with any type of clipping. So on here, first of all, you can see how much you can see immediately. You can see the castles here, but you can't see them here. It just looks completely blacked out. So I'm going to play it so you can see what I mean. Hopefully I can get this at the exact same time. There we go. Yeah, there's a lot more that you can see here. You can see the smoke. You can suddenly see Snape's face but really not much else. Ah, see what I mean there? Just so much more detail in the Galaxy Note 2. In lighter scenes, the Galaxy S3 will look just fine, but it's just anytime you start getting into the darker gradients when you start seeing shadows is when you're going to have an issue. Super Curio did fix the problem with Display Expert. I have messed around with it myself. It looks great. He will be releasing that. So it's just a software issue with the Galaxy S3 and not a hardware problem. So if you're someone who's an avid movie watcher, don't worry. There are fixes out there already, as it is. I've seen that somebody on XDA had messed around with the kernel to fix the blacks. I don't know to what extent it fixes it, but you can see that it is indeed fixable. So Super Curio will be releasing that application, and I can't wait till that happens. Still, this display has its imperfections. Super Curie and I were messing around with the display and noticed that there are different behaviors at different brightness levels. So for example, I made a video where I was showcasing this problem exactly, but he went and looked into the source code and found out exactly why. But watch this here for those of you who haven't seen it. I will link the video in my description. You should go and watch that as you can see in depth the issue as well. Now, here I am at 100% brightness. This is MX Player, and I'm going to drag my finger on the left-hand side to pull down the brightness. Now watch under his left eyelid. You can see here that we do now have some black clipping. It's at one color, and then suddenly it's black. We've lost all that definition in shadow. But when we go back upward, it's not like that. And as I go further and further downward, you can see how it is quote-unquote dancing around as you were changing that brightness. So he had seen that there are 33 different brightness levels, and in those 33 different brightness levels, every single one has its own algorithm to control the color and the shadow that you're seeing, or those gamma points within those brightness levels. There should not be 33 different algorithms to control what is happening over scaling the brightness. So this leads us to think that Samsung had made a mistake initially, and so now there are algorithms to try to compensate, and it is leading to inconsistencies here in the brightness. As I am going downward, it should be fading to a darker and darker color, but it should be smooth, a smooth effect. It should not be bouncing around like this. 
The times that I see this as annoying is in opening or ending scenes in movies where it goes fade out to black. Instead of going to smooth black from whatever you're looking at, it dances like gray, lighter gray, darker gray, lighter gray, darker gray, and it just it looks weird. So in practical terms, you will see this problem in fade-ins, fade-outs of movies, or in gradients or shadows if there is sudden change in lighting. That's when you will see that dancing around. In most things, especially in light scenes and when there are solid colors, you shouldn't see this problem. So they have traded black clipping now for dancing around with the shadows and gradients. Nice. Every display is going to have what I'd like to call sweet spots. Every display is going to be different because inherently it has its own capabilities with different brightness levels. So that means that at 100% it looks best for me in color and shadow. It looks best with the shadows and the colors don't look like they're jumping or turning any weird colors all of the sudden. But if I turn it to about 80% brightness, I start to see some black clipping in there. It's not very pleasant, especially right here on the bridge of his nose. But once I go downward, it gets better again. So you're going to find those sweet spots in your display. The question is, is this fixable? It has to do with what's going on in the display driver. And if someone like Super Curio can go in and mess around and make their own parameters for each brightness level and try to make it consistent, then I could see that foreseeable in the future. So I'm interested. Otherwise, just keep it at that sweet spot and you should be all right. So how about battery life on this guy? On the original Galaxy Note, battery life was pretty awesome. Now on the Galaxy Note 2, I have not seen battery life quite like this. Yes, yeah, so battery life is astounding on this phone. Let me take this out for you. This thing is 3100 milliamp hours. Holy cow, here's the iPhone 5. Now, this is the battery next to the iPhone 5. This is huge, huge. It's almost, it's even almost as thick as the iPhone 5. Holy cow. The biggest phone battery I have ever seen. My experience thus far has been easily being able to get six to seven hours of screen time. That's with heavy use. If any of you know me, I'm pretty crazy when it comes to using my phones. Six to seven hours of screen time in one day? That means constantly checking emails, watching movies, playing games, doing I don't even know what for how long. I don't know how anyone could possibly use a phone for that long during the day, but it lasts. And I usually have the screen at half brightness. Sometimes we'll have a live wallpaper, sometimes not. So that is impressive. This is the first phone I've had that I can't kill in one day. Your best battery results will occur when you keep Wi-Fi on most of the time, especially at home. Because when you keep Wi-Fi on, 3G or 4G stays idle. It's not sitting there looking for a connection or a signal. And instead, your Wi-Fi router is in your house. So that's a much less distance from being a couple feet away in your house to some cell site tower. So imagine that does help with battery life. Also, if you have the 3G version of the phone, your battery life is gonna last a little bit longer than the 4G versions. That's just how it is. It shouldn't make a gigantic difference, but you might see an hour or so difference in battery. As for antennas, you have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, NFC. You've also got your cellular radios, all of which perform Beautifully, I've had no issues whatsoever. NFC is probably one of the coolest features on this phone. If you have an NFC capable phone as well, you can tap it to this phone. You can share pictures, you can share web pages, whatever it is that you're looking at. Call quality is great. As for network speeds, it's gonna depend on which phone you have. There's the international version, which doesn't have LTE radio, so you're gonna get HSPA plus speeds depending on your network. There's the LTE versions that you get in the United States, and that's also going to depend on your network. Then there's the dual carrier version, which is the one that I have. So if you have a network that's capable of dual carrier, you will get twice as fast HSPA plus speeds like they do on T-Mobile, which isn't true 4G, but still you can get up to 42 megabits per second down. So that's pretty nice. So we are approaching one of my favorite parts. Let's go test out the camera. As for cameras on the front, it has a 1.9 megapixel camera. It's okay. It's a little bit grainy, especially when the lighting changes and it is not very good with changing exposure in different environments, but it does all right. If you're just wanting to do some type of video chatting, works great that way. On the back, you have an eight megapixel camera. That's exactly the same sensor as on the Galaxy S3. People have been complaining that the images end up being a little bit more soft in focus than on the Galaxy S3. I haven't had any issue with it. I'm going to show you a video sample and a lot of photos so that you can decide for yourself how you think it actually looks. 
where the camera shines on this phone is with its interface. There are a lot of very awesome features. Starting off with the camera mode, what I love is this. The single most awesome thing to mention on here is called best face. Just say that you're taking a photo of a person or of a group of people, and you wanna make sure you get that best picture that you can upload to Facebook. So what you can do is use the best face mode. It will take several shots, and then afterwards you can look at all the pictures and decide which faces that you like best. You can select the best faces that you like, and it will superimpose those in real time to have all the best faces that you want. That's a little bit creepy, but it's probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. It works really well too. You've got panorama mode that works really well. HDR mode is also a must, especially with these cameras. It takes three different exposures and then combines them all together so you have a high dynamic range, which means you have really nice shadows and you've also got really good colors as well. You've also got an effects mode. that You can add several different effects in real time. Or if you want to, you can go into one of the advanced editing softwares that I had shown you that's on the phone just by hitting the menu button after viewing the picture in the gallery and saying advanced edit. Also, you've got a lot of manual modes. You've got burst shot, which lets you take several different shots just by holding down the shutter button. You can use self-portrait mode. You can decide to have it on autofocus or manual focus if you'd like to. You can choose the resolution. You can choose the white balance, the ISO, the meterings. Probably the coolest setting is being able to talk to the camera now and give it a voice command. So I can tell it, capture, shoot, smile, or cheese, and it will take a picture. So, check this out. Capture. And took a picture. Check that out. That's pretty awesome. That'll be very useful when you're trying to take a picture of a group of people and you don't want to fiddle around looking for the capture button because there is no capture button on this phone. Also under video mode, you've got an anti-shake mode. You've got a slow motion mode, fast mode. You can also add effects in real time. My favorite mode for video camera mode is pushing record. You can actually push pause now. Instead of having to stop the clip and start a new clip, you can pause it. You can see it's paused at three seconds. I can go to a different scene or wherever else, push record again, and it resumes right at three seconds. Then you can stop it when you want to. As soon as you press the power button, it will stop the clip. Also, what every single phone should do is be able to lock focus or choose to keep it on autofocus. So if I'm recording and I tap it, I can tap to focus or I can hit autofocus and it will turn off tap to focus and it will autofocus. If I tap it again, it will take it off of autofocus mode and tap to focus. So it is very intuitive. I love what they have done. So here we have the Galaxy Note 2 with image stabilization on and also autofocus on. Let's see how it does. It has the same sensor as the Galaxy S3, although some people have been complaining that they are not too impressed with the sensor on this guy. I've been pretty happy with it though. Now let's try for rolling shutter with image stabilization on. So we are redoing the test now without anti-shake on. See how it does now with rolling shutter. Eesh, it looked nicer I think with image stabilization on. Let's see what it does with macro shots. Stop moving. It does all right.
So this has been Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff. Thank you everyone for watching. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. You can get to all that from my YouTube main channel page. If you request to be my friend on Facebook, I will add you pretty much no matter what, unless you're a complete creep and start trolling everybody. That might cause a little bit of a problem. But if you have any questions for me, you're free to contact me there. You can also leave me any type of questions in the description. I always do my very best to answer you if you have any types of questions. And I hope I helped you decide if this is the proper phone for you. I know it's the most wonderfulest phone for me right now. It's... I even named it, okay? So... Really, really good phone. I applaud you, Samsung. Thank you.